Welcome to another edition of Daily Airline News, focusing on the search for MH370. I'm Geoffrey Thomas. The episode today is What Happened to All the Debris? We have quite an episode for you today with some fascinating topics. Where is all the debris? Didn't MH3 shatter into a million pieces? And what is the longest endurance of an AUV? But before I get to those topics, let's look at Amada 8605, and she appears to be back on track, moving northeast up the 7th arc, but to the right of the 7th arc. First, I'm showing you her position relative to Western Australia. And the next picture is a deep dive into her movements. Remember, this is the ship's track not the track of the AUVs, which operate in a strict grid search pattern. Her speed at 0545 UTC on January 13th was 0.04 knots on a course of 323.9 degrees. She's been uh, um, collecting and picking up AUVs. The wind is 10 knots from the north and the swell is 2.2 metres or 6.6 feet. And I'm showing you an image right now of her position relative to the sea state. And you can see she's in a dark area, which is uh, very calm. There is, as I've mentioned before, to the west of her, uh, a little bit of uh, an increase in swell. It remains to be seen how that will impact her possibly on Thursday. Now, tomorrow I'll be joined by Richard, uh, who is doing the fine research into how many AUVs have been launched and what the overall progress is. So I'm uh, I'm sure you'll be interested in that particular episode. And talking of Richard, please subscribe to his new aircraft investigation channel. And there is a link below for you to do that. And if you're not subscribing to this channel, well, please do for daily updates on Amada 8605's progress. Finally, some of you have asked about my current location. Well, let's change the background for a, for a view from our balcony. So there you have it. This is my rustic chalet background on the edge of a forest in Denmark, Western Australia. So um, I hope that satisfies a couple of the queries that have been asked. Now let's get back to business and uh, I'll just change that background again. Now, as I promised, onto some great topics. And as K Man of Kent says, I really enjoy the Q&A because I learned so much from the viewers' questions and your answers, Jeffrey. Cheers from the south of England. So let's start off with this one. This is a really interesting one that comes up over and over again. Test193 asks... Why do people dismiss the missing 2 million pieces so easily? That's 2 million pieces of debris, obviously. We have only found 40-ish pieces of the plane at this point. Well, in fact, we've found 60. But that's just not realistic for a plane that was supposedly obliterated into 2 million pieces. Use some logic. Where are all those floating seat cushions and luggage that surely would have floated? there would likely be a 100,000 pieces that float after a high-speed water crash, total obliteration of the plane. Why have we not found the other estimated 99,955 pieces? Just 45 pieces found. Really? That sounds reasonable? Question mark. So let's examine the topic. Firstly, we don't know how many pieces it was broken into. The 777 is the structurally strongest aircraft built by Boeing. There is no question it broke up, but into 2 million pieces? Highly unlikely. We have found the flapper on and wing flap, and they are large pieces. They survived the impact. Next, it's more than likely that the aircraft broke into four or five large pieces, ahead of the wing, behind the wing, and possibly the nose, and the tail broke away. And of course, then you've got the wings themselves. The fragmentation of tiny pieces that have been found is about the composite and fiberglass honeycomb non-structural parts of the aircraft. The luggage, for instance, does not float and possibly could be in some uh, containers still in parts of the fuselage. So for sure, 
there should be thousands of pieces floating wreckage, but we didn't start searching the area where we think it's located until 20 days after it was lost. In the meantime, two cold fronts moved through. The currents took the scattered debris north and then west to Africa, where it started turning up in July 2015. Why wasn't more found? It's a good question. There's never been an official search organised by the Malaysians, and there are thousands and thousands of kilometres of lonely beaches around the Indian Ocean to cover, and in many cases, the locals don't know anything about MH370. And I'm sure there are many, many pieces of debris, probably now buried in sand, uh, all around the um, western side of the Indian Ocean. In a related question, 000, destruct zero, I hadn't given much thought up till now, but couldn't bigger pieces of the plane floated and drifted for days before coming waterlogged and sunk to the bottom? If so, you could find parts of the plane on the ocean floor, but still be hundreds of miles from the site the plane came down. Well, it's an interesting point. The answer is possibly some may have become waterlogged uh, as the air was able to escape. For instance, if a flap had a small crack from the crash, water could seep in and slowly replace the air and then it would sink and it may have drifted 10, 15, 20, 100 miles. Now, Fayaz Ahmed, 1281. How much time would it had have taken for MA370 floating debris to get dispersed from the day of the crash. I think faster dispersal made initial aerial search difficult to find floating debris. Is there any data regarding aerial surveys of areas of interest like Whisper and others? Well, it's a great question and again relates to two cold fronts that passed through the search area or search areas um, and the searches themselves weren't started till March the 18th, 2014, and then moved north on March the 28th. The day MH370 crashed, there was a cold front coming through with four metre waves, that's 12 foot waves. So to answer your question, it was dispersed very quickly. And we're also showing you now a map of the area that was searched. You can see the most southerly area, which is down near the Bleli Mashand IJ, IG area that was searched on the uh, 18th of March. The area further north is closer to the Whisper area and that wasn't searched till the 28th of March 2014. Now, Chris Kiwi, 2601, the only two things likely to be located will be the two engines. Sorry, Chris, don't forget the undercarriage and the wing box, which is the strongest part of the aircraft, just to name a few pieces that you will find at the bottom. So from Bob L 78 in a related question, to my knowledge, there is very little to no current at this depth, so it is very unlikely that it is covered in silt. Look and many deep sea wrecks like the Titanic, for example, even after a very long time, they're still not covered. Now, Bob, you're absolutely right. We're showing a map of the thermohaline currents, which are deep ocean currents driven by density differences from temperature, thermo and salinity haline. These form the global conveyor belt that transports heat, nutrients and carbon worldwide, starting when cold, salty water sinks in polar regions like the North Atlantic and the South Atlantic, drawing warmer surface water to replace it, a process critical for climate uh, regulation. As you can see from the map, that current doesn't come close to the search area. Now, we move on. DCF4PSU. Is it safe to say at this point MH370 was not found in the Bleli Mashand hotspot area? I think it is safe to say that, although we've had no official confirmation, 
but going on the evidence from the search, uh, it would appear that is the case. Now, on to another fascinating topic, which has been raised by How's It Old Man? I hope he's not referring to me. And that is anyone, any company, any government working on AUVs that can operate year-round? Interesting question. Well, not quite, but there are some very impressive AUV uh, that are, are now being deployed and or in development or refinement. Kronzberg's Hugen Endurance 6000 is a large, capable AUV designed for missions lasting 15 to 16 days, achieving record-setting multi-week autonomous operations with ranges of over 1,200 nautical miles. The AUV is 10 metres long and 1.2 metres wide, so I'm showing you a picture of it at the moment. There's also the Grey Shark. This is a long endurance vehicle built for extended deployments with capabilities for missions lasting up to 16 weeks and covering vast distances. It is designed by the German company Euro Atlas GmbH in collaboration with Evo Logix and Fasima. It is a military project and uh, will be used by NATO countries. There's also Auto Sub Long Range, ALR. While a specific record isn't stated for the longest duration, this type of long range AUV has completed continuous field trials of several weeks uh, and was about a 2,000 uh, kilometre trial. Now, change of pace, viewers, we have some hellos and best wishes from Kayla Chetty 754 in South Africa, as well as Liam Cecil Brown, also watching from South Africa. He says, so invested in this search, hopefully this year yields um, results. Fatima Gravatar sends cheers from Mozambique, and River Rio R sends lots of love from Izmar in Turkey, while Ming Blue says good morning from New York, and Mandrake 2112 cheers from Montevideo in Uruguay. Now, at Geo72 Sadler, um, he would like to know what, it, what takes me around WA. Well, very simple family holidays with some of our children and grandchildren. We love the southwest and its magnificent forests, beaches and wineries and all its wilderness. And I've been showing you a couple of pictures uh, of that uh, uh, as I've been speaking. So that is all we have time for for today. Please do tune in tomorrow because we've got Richard uh, back, which will be great. And some of you have also asked for me to put the seventh arc into the fly through. I'll work on that. But right now, for the moment, it's down the middle of the survey area I'm now showing you. So dead center of the image you're seeing right now, that is the seventh arc. And then again, as I said, you'll see the Blely Machand area, the IG area, and then further up past Broken Ridge is the Whisper area. So please subscribe, please like us, please keep the great comments and questions coming. And finally, please do support responsible journalism. And we'll see you all tomorrow. Take care.